We got a lot of cool stories here in 2 Kings chapter 4. It's really a summary, well not even a summary, it's a, this chapter 4 is really dedicated to uh, some miracles that Elisha did. We see the, the first one with the, um, him helping out that widow woman and the oil not failing so he'd be able to provide for her household. And then we see the, the woman that had an old husband and she was blessed with having a child. That alone was a miracle. And then the miracle of the child being raised back to, from the dead when the child died. And then at the end here, when there was death in the pot, he healed that food so everyone was able to eat. And then, even after that, then was the, the multiplication of the bread that was brought that was very similar to, to the miracle that Jesus performed. And many of these are similar to miracles that Jesus performed. And I think one of the things, just on a big overview, this demonstrates is the power of God and the power of God is timeless, literally. Like, I mean, God could use people and perform miracles at any time throughout history. And even though there are some things that don't happen necessarily very often, it happened, you know, these miracles are being performed with Elisha. They're being performed when Jesus was walking this earth. And um, really, you know, as, you know, and obviously not taking anything away from Jesus Christ or anything, but the miracles that he performed through the power of God were, you know, are, were similar to, to other miracles. He just did a whole bunch of them, a lot, you know, like, like in a short period of time and, and was just, you know, doing obviously a lot for God. But what's cool is that we see this, some of these same miracles. I mean, even bringing someone back from the dead, I mean, bringing someone to life. Obviously, Elisha didn't have that power inherently or innately. God performed the miracle, but God uses people... One of the things that we notice, though, is that when the miracles are performed, they're performed through, like, in the Bible, when we see recorded miracles, they're, record, they're, they're through people who are really good men of God. I mean, it's not just your average believer that's just out there performing miracles. It's the disciples, the apostles, it's the, the, the prophets, you know, that are that God is really using to this level of, of, of even being able to then perform miracles and stuff. See, they're vessels that are meat for the master's use. They have already um, disciplined themselves to be living righteously and doing right and preaching the word of God and dedicating themselves to serving the Lord by the time they're meat in the master's eyes to be used to then glorify God even further and to perform these miracles and stuff. And I think that, I mean, it's very wise if you think about it, why God would only use extremely mature men of God to even perform miracles because think about how easy you get puffed up in your own mind as to thinking, wow, look at all this power I have. I mean, even Jesus was warning his disciples, you know, when they thought how cool it was, they were casting out devils and stuff, like, you know, again, real vague summary, but just tell them not to get so caught up and hung up about that and more about just preaching the gospel and stuff because, yes, God did give him those powers and God did give him that ability to do those things, but it's, uh, you need to be very humble because you're not honoring or glorifying yourself. You're honoring and glorifying God. And that's the, that is the big distinction. That's what's going on. That's why I believe God's only going to use certain people to even give them that type of power to do that thing. That's why, you know, we read these Bibles, or these Bibles, we read, we read the Bible, we read these stories about men of God like Elisha, and we recognize that God is all-powerful. God is capable of doing these things, and the only thing that's really preventing him is us limiting God and how God's going to use us. And but at the same time, you know, we're not like the Pentecostals that see something like this and just think that, oh, this is just happening all the time and all these churches and, and they have these phony false prophets like the Benny Hens that, that get up and they put on a show and they deceive people saying, oh, yeah, see, it's just like in the Bible. You know, we all have this power and everything else. Not even close. Do you know how many people have literally been raised from the, you know, I mean, recorded in the Bible as being raised from the dead? Not very many. It wasn't just Jesus that did it, but it's not like this was happening every day or every week. I mean, these are serious miracles. And think about it, if, if this stuff was just happening all the time, it wouldn't even seem like a miracle, right? Because then it's just like, well, it's just the way things are. 
No, they're miracles. They're special events that happen to, uh, to bring the honor and glory unto God. And they're used through very special people who have dedicated themselves and demonstrated that they are, you know, serving the Lord with all of their heart and, and, and really doing a great work for God. So um, let's get into the stories here now. Look, I just want to kind of do that, that broad overview of chapter 4, but um, these, are, these are all amazing. It's, it's, there's so much packed into here. Verse number 1 says, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. But now, before we even get into the miracle that's performed here, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how you need to be smart with your money. This is somebody who was of the sons of the prophets, right? He's a preacher, preacher guy, married, has children. He ends up dying, leaving his wife a widow, and his, finan his, his, his finances were in such a mess that now the creditor, the person who he's been borrowing money from, is coming to collect on the debt because he can't pay anymore because he's dead. And what does he do? He's coming to get the sons that are able to work off and pay for that debt. And this guy dying leaves his family in a horrible situation. He's basically leaving his sons to be indentured servants to pay off the debt that he accrued. We need to be smart and make sure, you know, even though you might be a good guy at heart, you might be someone who loves the Lord, okay, but you're not immune to financial problems. Now, the Bible is very clear that, you know, this world is not all about making money and that's not what our life should be focused on and just focused on the mammon of this world. No, that's not what we should be focused on. But you have to wonder how much this, this servant or the sons of the prophet even really did love the Lord because the Bible says, I mean, maybe he just lacked a lot of faith because the Bible says that if you're doing the work of God and if you're putting God first and his, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the Bible says all these things shall be added unto you, which is your daily provisions, the things that you actually need in this lifetime. So your food and your clothing, those things will be given to you by God if you are working for him. If you are truly putting forth the effort and working for him, there is no reason for you to be getting into debt at all. Amen. There really isn't. The, the reason would be either you're not working for God, so God's not taking care of you the way that you think you ought to, or you're too focused on things that you think you need that you don't actually need that you're so willing to go into debt for and have this instant gratification of having this right now instead of waiting, earning for it, say, I don't have it right now. If I don't have it right now, then I don't need it. We'll get by. We'll survive. We'll live. Yeah, we have a lot of, we live in a world of luxury. We live in a world where there's so many conveniences and technologies that make your life easier. And you might think, wow, I really need to have this, but you don't. And the TV and the radio and the newspaper and the internet, and your emails are all going to tell you how much you need these products when you don't. Now, it's not sinful to have appliances, to have tools, to have things that make your life easier, to have luxuries. Great. Amen, it's good. You, you can have that stuff, but don't go into debt for them. Right. You go into debt, you're going into bondage. Right. The Bible says that the, the borrower is servant to the lender. So the person who's lending the money has the power. You are bringing yourself under bondage to somebody when you go out and borrow money from them. And look, it's tempting. We live in a world that's all about credit. It's all about, I mean, that's what the, you know, we're, we're headed towards a one world government and headed towards a cashless society where everything's going to be based on credit. How much credit you got? But watch out for that because you, get, you start borrowing money, you're going to be in, you know, you're definitely in debt, you're going to be a bondman. And in this story, this man got himself into so much debt that his sons, who should have been there to at least be able to help out their mom, now are going to be taken to satisfy a debt. And he left his... I mean, think about what does that say for how much you love your wife and kids? 
I mean, every man here has to, has to be thinking about me cognizant of the fact that we don't know the day or the hour of our own death when we're going to pass on, and we need to make sure that we're doing our best to make sure that our family will at least be taken you know, that we're not just going to burden them with a big debt. I'm not saying you have to have a whole mansion laid up for them, but that you can do your best to take care for them. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. The Bible says a good man is going to leave an inheritance. So while we're not focused on and wrapped up and consumed with this world's goods and finances, it still has a place in our life that you need to be aware of to take care of the people that you love, to take care of your family. And if you're a good man, you're not just going to be wasting all the money that you do earn on yourself or just you know, indulging in everything on yourself because you'll be focused on other people. You'll be focused on your posterity. You'll be focused on your family after you and doing things to make sure, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of my family. Now, look, there are always exceptions where things come up. And I would say this right off the bat. If there's like, if your health is on the line and you don't have means to, to pay for, for some emergency or something like that, it's justified. I mean, your life is more valuable than any goods that, you know, any amount of money that you could earn even in a lifetime. I'm willing to be indentured myself and be an indentured servant for the rest of my life if it means saving my wife's life or saving one of my kids' lives. That should go without saying. But that is a far cry from the principle of if you don't have the money, don't spend what you don't have. And that's, that would be a, a, a very extreme exception to this rule of getting into debt. And I guess one other one that in, in our society, the way things are, I don't, I don't even recommend it, but like, you know, when you buy a house, you're still getting into debt. It's not the best decision. It's never the best. Getting into debt is never the best decision. But at least with a house, you could have some kind of equity as long as you're not buying, you know, buying it with the, the bubbles and, and getting, you know, buying foolishly when something's not really worth what the price is at then it's best just to wait off and, and you know, kind of pay attention to that. So, but, um, I mean, even that, though, you don't, need, you, don't need, you don't need to buy a house to live. Can, you could rent. You can rent from other people. I mean, let's face it, it's, it's, it's an expense, but it's something you can do. So it's not, a, you know, when we're talking about necessities, understand that you get that through your minds, especially the women, get this through your minds, of what is a need and what is a want. This is something that we constantly go over in my own house. I need to remind myself of it and just say, do we need this or do we want this? Is this something that's necessary, like our food, like clothing, or is it something that we want? Very important distinction. Need, some of the things I think we need to have is, is like we need to have a roof over our head. I'm going to put that in a need category. Food, we need to have that. And we start getting into cell phone bills. That's not a need. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's some things that, that I would consider somewhat of a need. I need to have internet for my work to be able to work remotely, but, you know, at the end of the day, that's, you know where I'm going with that. So, anyways, we need to be smart with our money. We need, oh, a good man's going to leave an inheritance to his children's children. Be looking out for your posterity, looking out for people in front of you and doing the best that you can to manage what God has given you and not just be a waster either. Not be a waster of your substance. Yeah. But what God has blessed you with, God, you know, God blesses everyone differently, especially when it comes to financial things. I mean, some people don't have a lot of money and maybe never will. And they're very hard workers. They're, you know, they're serving the Lord or doing a lot of things. But God has deemed it better for them to not have a lot of money. Because let's face it, some people... And I'm not saying people who don't have a lot of money are like this, but if, it, you know, it, God knows us better than we know ourselves. And I would pray to God that if I'm going to have a problem getting led away and distracted with this world's goods, then I'd rather not have them. If that's going to be a stumbling block for me where I'm going to be lifted up with pride, I'm going to reject the Lord, or I'm just going to get so wrapped up in all these things, 
then I don't even want it. I'd rather be dirt poor. I'd rather be living in a two-bedroom apartment with my whole family than, you know, I mean, that's what I would rather have if it's going to be one or the other. Absolutely. And if God has blessed you, you, you know, we still need to keep the same, you need to keep the same mindset no matter what state you're in. Whether you're based or whether you're bound. Whether God lifts you up or brings you down, we need to have the same humble mindset. But we also need to not be a waster of what God has blessed us with. And not just throw it all, you know, not be not caring about it. You know, the, the Bible says, um, and I can't quote the verse right now, but, but who's going to entrust to you the great riches if you're not esteeming the little things? And I consider money to be one of the more minor things, the little things. So if you're not even good at handling the little things, the, the things that aren't that important, then who's going to entrust to you the great riches, the true riches? And God looks at that too. So the way that you manage whatever God has given you is going to help determine how much God will give you more of then. If God sees that you're really good at, at, um, at leading and, and um, teaching, you know, God's going to open up doors for you to do more of that. Because that's what God wants you. He wants you working for him. But if God's given you these abilities, don't go and waste it either. Whether it's the abilities, whether it's the money, you know, whatever it is, whatever you've been blessed with, don't just go and waste it. Because then you're not, then you're not going to be blessed with anything more. But providing for your house is extremely important. And this, this person, we, if according to the story, I mean, we don't know all the details of it. Maybe there was some emergency, maybe, you know, but we see this widow woman now is stuck. And what's she going to do? She's not going to have her sons to help her. She's left all alone. Her husband died. And there's this big debt hanging over their head. The Bible says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Not only do we have to be worried, you know, concerned and thinking about that verse while we're alive and providing for our family, but think about after you pass on. If you're leaving behind your family, are you have you provided for them? Are you going to be able to Make sure that they're not in this situation where they just don't know what to do. And you're just leaving them with a debt. It's a very grievous uh, situation to be in and, and nobody ought to um, put their families through that. And, and, it's, and it, could be so, it could be avoided so much even without a big income. You don't need to have a ton of money to avoid going into debt. What you have to have is self-control and discipline into what you're spending, what you do have on. That is key. But we see this widow woman, though, she has the right attitude. She's going to the right place. She found herself in trouble, and who does she go to? She goes to the man of God. So that's the right decision to make. And she actually receives mercy because God uses Elisha to, to help save her and her family from this financial destruction, this, this big mess in her life. Look at verse number two. The Bible says, And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Now, I'm going to assume that she's telling the truth there because I mean, first he's asking, Well, what do you got in your house? Because what is she doing? I mean, what's he going to have her do? He's going to have her sell what she has. And we have to be willing to do that too. I, I am. I had this this just recently at the gas station. This old this old lady was in, sitting in her car, and it's a pretty nice car. It was, I mean, I don't know. It was like a PT Cruiser or something, but it looked kind of newer. And I thought it was kind of odd, but she looked like she'd been crying and upset. And I come out of the gas station and I look at her, and she's like, "My husband just left yesterday," and. I don't know what to do, and I do, do you have any money? I, you know, I'm just thinking like, well, that's kind of weird. And I'm reaching in my, in my pocket, and I'm just, you know, like I got a couple bucks, and I was just thinking like, I've never had an old lady like crying, asking for money before. And I, I felt bad for her. I was thinking like, okay. And I don't even normally do this in general. Um, but then she's like, well, she's like, I need to go, get, I need to get cigarettes. That's what the money's for. I was like, absolutely not. 
no way. I don't have money for your cigarettes. And it's like, like, I know she doesn't know me, but I've got a family to feed. And if you're really down and out and like something happened, you know, I'm willing to like pull out my hard earned money to help you out. I've got five children and a wife at home. I don't have money for your cigarettes. But it's like the priorities. I need cigarettes. I need to have this and I'm willing to beg for cigarettes. Look, if you need cigarettes that bad, you've got to sell your car. Sell other things, you know, sell off whatever you got. Don't go asking hardworking people for money so you can support your drug habit. Ridiculous. But no, and, and if you find yourself in a bind, you know what you need to do? You need to, to s take an inventory of stuff that you have. And you know, I believe it's a right, before you go begging for money, get rid of the stuff that you have that you don't need. And there's all good, it might, be, it might, it might hurt. There might be a lot of things. I mean, there's things that I've got, you know, a gun collection or whatever, but if push comes to shove and I need money for something, I'm sick of these people that are going around just, oh, you know, oh, man, well, I lost my job. I need some money and stuff. But, but look at all the stuff that you have. Why don't you sell some of that first? And really see, you know, see where that goes instead of being so covetous and so, and so wanting to cling to your goods so bad that you claim you have no money, yet you have all of this wealth just sitting there. Help yourself out first. So, you know, if you need to part with some things, then part with some things. It's called having a right heart and being a, you know, having some integrity too. To not just always be looking for handouts and looking for other people to save you out of stuff when most likely you got yourself in the problem to begin with and you already have means out and you're just looking for the handout. And really, these people who are, who are borrowing that, you know, or asking for all the handouts are ruining it for the people who really do have needs, legitimate needs. People who, you know, they're lame, they're maimed, they can't work, and they need someone to help them because they physically can't do things themselves. But you've got all these other jerks going around and trying to support their drug habits, their alcoholism, their cigarette addiction, whatever it is, and they're going as a point to where you know, people don't want to help anyone out anymore at all because you got so many people out there just that don't, that don't really need it. Yeah. They need a swift kick in the pants more than anything. Don't be deceived by their faces. <laughs> the old lady deceived me, I'll tell you what. I was, I was shocked to have her to say that. I was like, what in the world are you talking about? But um, anyways... Let's, let's keep going here because he, he does, he helps this woman out. She's in a, she's in a serious bind. She's got nothing, she's got nothing in the house but a pot of oil. Like I said, I believe her. I, I believe in this story. I believe she's telling the truth. So all I got left in my house is a pot of oil. But one of the things that this story demonstrates is that if you bring to God all that you have, and it doesn't have to be much, just a pot of oil. God could bless you and multiply and do things that you, that, that humanly speaking would be impossible. But God is capable of making all things happen. And you bring that pot of oil and say, well, what have you got? Got a pot of oil. What have you got? Five loaves of bread and two fishes. What have you got? Well, this is what we got. Here we go, God. What can we do with this? And you're bringing it to God. God could bless. God multiplies and God can see you through. She goes to the man of God. God, I got this problem. It's not the widow's fault that her husband was not good with money. She's stuck in this situation. And God shows mercy on her and says, I decided to help her out. So she's got this pot of oil. Look at verse number three. Then he said, go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, 
bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. So we see here the, the, the command to go out and just, he said, get a lot of empty vessels, empty cups, empty pitchers, whatever you can to hold this oil. And he says, when you get those all, go into your house, shut the door and start pouring out your oil. And every time it fills up, put it to the side and keep filling up. And that's what she did. And, and notice, so he said, he said, borrow not a few. And I think there's a few things that we could learn from this, um, from this miracle, other than the fact that she's just being helped here, right? What's on the surface. God's looking to fill his vessels with oil. When you look at the way that oil is used in the, in the Bible, oftentimes it's, it's um, symbolizing the Spirit or the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. And when you're filled with oil, a vessel filled with oil, you're filled with the Spirit. And we see here, um, you know, she's bringing all of these empty vessels to be filled with the Spirit. He said, borrow not a few. God wants her to have, God wants to have a lot of vessels, many vessels that are filled with the Spirit, that are filled with the Holy Ghost. And not only that, what does she end up using these for? She sells them. You know, God wants us, wants to have many vessels filled with the Spirit to then be profitable for Him, to go out and do His work. And not just being saved, but being profitable, being, being profitable servants to go out and, and serve Him, walking in the Spirit, being filled with the Holy Ghost and going out and doing a great work. God wants us also to go all in towards all the things that He tells us to do. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. What we do, we should be with all of our heart, with all of our spirit. When we're serving God, let's, let's, when, we're, when we're doing anything, is what the Bible is saying there, and that was in reference to servants. You know, servants, you know, obey your masters, do, you know, do your work, and whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. So in everything that we're doing in our life, we ought to be doing it heartily. We ought to be, be all in on it. Because if, that, if, if we're setting our mind to do something, then let's do it and let's do it right. And when we're going to set our, our mind to work for the Lord, let's not be lazy about it. Let's not be slack about it. Let's not be dragging our feet about it. Let's be excited about it. Let's have a fervent spirit. And let's just go all out and serve God. God's looking for, for vessels. And He wants them full. And we see that happening here. So He has this amazing miracle. She's able to now supply the needs for her household from all the oil that she got. Because, of course, she goes and sells oil to other people and... and has, is able to pay off her debt. So let's keep reading here. Verse number seven. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. So she had enough. God took care of her enough to not only pay off the debt, but also to live of the rest. And notice, she could have been skeptical and been like, What? Like, I don't have that much. I only have one pot of oil. And he told her, Borrow not a few. I believe if she only had borrowed a few, she would have only gotten a few vessels full of oil and that's where it would have been. And then if she would have been like, oh no, this is going to work. Oh, let's try to find something else. It would have been done. And she would have had what she had and would have paid what she paid off and the rest of it would have been on her. That's why it's important to have that level of faith to just be able to say, all right, you know, this is what God said. I may not understand it all, but I'm not going to borrow a few. I'm going to borrow, you know, because... After she did that, notice, he didn't tell her to go and sell the oil. He just said, go this, borrow not a few, and fill the oil. And then he's like, okay, go sell that you have, pay off your debt, and you're going to live of the rest. And that was the plan. And so however many she was able to borrow, however fervently she obeyed that command to go out and borrow vessels, is going to determine then how well it's going to take care of her for the future. So the harder, and I, again, another... Um, truth here is that the harder you're working for God, the longer God's going to be caring and taking care for you because when you only are doing a little bit, you know, you're not, don't, don't expect to not be begging bread. The Bible says that the righteous, you know, the David said he hasn't seen the righteous begging bread and the people who are working hard. Yeah, you're not going to be begging bread, but if you're not doing anything at all, if you're just lazy and you don't, you're not doing anything for God, well, he may very well bring you to poverty and, and try to get your, uh, get your mind right. 
So let's keep reading. We've got the next story, verse number 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman. Now it says great there. That's referring to literally her size. as a you know, large woman. is a great woman. Not just that she's cool or, or a great person, but um, so she was this, this bigger lady, great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. So he's going on his way. He's passing through Shunem, and this lady sees him and says, hey, come on, you know, come on in and have a meal. Come have lunch, right? Come sit down with me and have some lunch. So every time it became this thing, he's, he's passing through, and he stops at this, at this lady's house and has a meal with her. And then in verse number 9, And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. And I want you to notice, this, Shun, this Shunammite lady is a, is a great example. She, she's a, she is a great lady, other than it, I mean, I, I do believe it's talking about her size. She is a great lady. Not just her size. She has a great heart. Because she sees someone passing by, doesn't even know who it is, and is just being hospitable to someone passing through town. Hey, come on in and have a meal. Right? Being real generous, real nice, opening up her house. And after the course of time, she starts to realize, hey, this is a, this is a man of God. He said, you know, I'm sure they had conversations or whatever. She starts to realize, so she goes to her husband and says, you know what, this is a holy man of God that I've been inviting over for lunch. And so she asks him, verse 10, she said, let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. And let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. So now she's like, well, let's just make a little room for him in their house. Being even more generous, more hospitable. Say, hey, this is a man of God. We should, we should really be helping him out. Make a little bed for him, a little nightstand, a little place to, to take a rest in his journeys. Because he's journeying back and forth. He comes through this place. And uh, so that's what they do. Verse 11, And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. So she's not only very hospitable and caring, but she's very humble. She's not looking for anything in return. She's, he's saying, look, you've done all this for us now. What can I do for you? How can I help you out? Do you want me to go and, and speak to the king for you? you? Want me to put in a good word for you? you? Want me to talk to the captain of the host? You know, because she's in this foreign land. She's in this um, in Shunem. You know, it's not technically a part of Israel, so he's out. She's out in, in this other um, area, and she said, well, what can I do for you? She's like, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm okay right here. I'm fine to dwell among my people. Very humble. This is a very, very, very great lady. And uh, so then he talks to Gehazi, his servant. Verse number 14, he says, and he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, verily, she hath no child and her husband is old. And he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door and he said, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And this is obviously something that the woman really wanted. And she's been real humble. She wasn't asking for anything in return, but he decides to give her a blessing. And this is just one more instance where we see, you know, God is the one that ultimately is responsible for opening and closing the womb. And, he, and this is a prayer now that, that is going to be answered for her to have a child, even though her husband is real old and she hasn't had a child. But it's something that we see here is she wanted so bad, she doesn't want to get her hopes up about if it's not true, right? That's why she's saying, like, don't lie to me. You know, don't, don't be playing these games with me. You know, don't lie to me and tell me I'm going to have a child because she really wanted one. And, um, but of course, uh, Elisha wasn't lying to her and, and God hearkened unto Elisha's uh, prayer for her. And verse 17 says, And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. Now, when it says he was grown, it doesn't mean that he's like an adult. Because a child is still young, and we'll see that here in a minute. So he goes out, he's old enough to be like maybe a toddler walking around, you know, a few years old, whatever. But it says he went out to his father, to the reapers, and he said unto his father, 
my head, my head, and he said to a lad, carry him to his mother. So he calls a lad, a young lad, to carry him to his mother. So we could tell from this context that he's not like some old, you know, child, older, you know, he's, he's still pretty young. And he's having problems, like a head, you know, he's having a headache or fever or whatever. And um, so he's carried back to his mother, verse 20, and when he had taken him, and brought him to his mother. He sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither a new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. The... Uh, this lady amazes me with, with, with her character and all that she is because notice she doesn't freak out about her son dying. Now, you know how much she loved and wanted to have a child. She's like, don't lie to me. You know, don't tell me this unless it's true. And that's how she ends up approaching him too. Like, didn't I tell you not to lie to me? You know, because she really wants this child so bad and loves him so much that now you give it to her and now she, he's going to die. But she doesn't freak out. She's not screaming her head off when she goes to her husband. She's just saying, hey, send me, you know, please send me to, to the man of God and have someone ride me there. And, um, and he's like, why? You know, like it's not, it, there's no feast going on. It's not a new moon. There's no reason to go see the man of God. But she's like, it shall be well. She knows to go to God, to the man of God, to the right place with her problem as well. It's not something that she, she didn't go to seek out the doctor. She didn't go, you know, like she was like, if anyone's going to help me, God's going to help me. Amen. And has the reliance and trust in the Lord. So verse 24 says, Then she saddled the an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So, I mean, it's not that she's not in a hurry. I mean, she's, it's, it's not that she's not stressed out and upset and, and really trying to get things done. But she's not, um, she's still able to handle the situation and do what needs to be done. So she's, she's just saying, like, put the pedal to the metal. Don't worry about me. Get there as fast as you can, right? Verse 25. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. So when she meets Gehazi, she's just like, yep, yep, everything's fine, because she wanted to go straight to Elisha. She wanted to deal with the servant. Verse 27, and when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. So she goes and just like, just like grabs him by the feet, and Gehazi is ready to be like, you know, get away, lady, you know, and shoot and kind of shoo her away off of Elisha. But Elisha stops him and um, it says, And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me. So this was a surprise, Elisha, because a lot of times you see the prophets, they know in advance, like God tells them when people are going to see him and when things are major kind of going on, when the king was going off to see if his son was going to die, you know, God's telling these prophets to go and, and do things and giving them the information before they even uh, show up. But th in this case, he had no idea what was going on. And he's like, leave her alone. You know, she's vexed. She's having a problem. And I don't know what it is. So verse 28, and then she said, did I desire a son of my Lord? Didn't I say, don't trick me about this? Then he said to Gehazi, gird up thy loins and take my staff in thine hand and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. So he tells Gehazi, okay, go ahead of me, you know, get there as fast as you can and just lay my staff on the child. Now, I don't know, honestly, I, I'm sure, I believe that this has a meaning and I don't know exactly what that is, him laying the staff on the, on the child. But um, obviously he thought it was very important and something that needed to be done, um, you know, prior to him getting there. Um, the only thing that I was able to think of, but it doesn't seem to make that much sense is you know, when the serpent was lifted up, it was like a staff, a brazen serpent in the, in the wilderness, and people looked under the staff that they were healed from the snake bites when the children of Israel walked there. It was kind of an image of Jesus Christ being lifted up 
and looking unto him for salvation. But, um, I mean, to me, it still seems kind of like a, a, a stretch to put the staff on the child. So I don't know. I'm just going to throw that out there. But um, continuing on here with the story, it says in verse 31, And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awaked. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. So Elisha goes in himself and just, he closes the door, so it's just him and the dead child there, and he prays unto God. And here we see, the, again, the, the awesome power of God and the awesome power of prayer and why we still continue to pray and have our prayer list and the, the prayer requests of people we pray for, even people who are in situations that it's going to be, you know, sure death. I don't know about you, but I still pray to God for a complete healing in these situations because I believe that God, I, I see it in the Word of God, I see it happen with other people, and I, and I know God's still capable of doing it, and if the Lord will, He can save anybody He wants and heal that person, and they'll be just fine. So we do the same thing here. We pray unto the Lord. And he went up. Jonathan, go sit down. So he prays. The first thing he does, he gets in there, he shuts the door, he's alone with the child, and he prays unto the Lord. Verse 34, And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands, and he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. So first he goes, he prays to God, and then he puts his, his hand, like he basically mirrors himself on the child on the bed. And um, then he starts to feel the body's, the, the child's body warm up. Because you know, when you die, when you die you're, you know, blood's not pumping, your body's going to start going cold. So he feels the, the child starting to revive. Verse 35, then he returned, walked in the house to and fro, and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she was come in unto him, he said, take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. What an amazing story of a, of a child even being brought back to life. And what, and what a great example in this Shunammite woman who we don't even ever get her name. She's just this Shunammite, this woman of Shunam. A good example of someone who had great faith, very hospitable, you know, looking out for the man of God, doing everything she could. And again, I don't think this is a mistake. When, when you have this type of a heart and an attitude a humble attitude and willing to serve that, you know, you reap what you sow. So when she had something, you know, hard times falling on her, what happened? She was, she, she received a miracle from God. And you know, this isn't the only time, even later, when there's a dearth in the land and, they, and she leaves to go somewhere else and then comes back and the king's hearing about things that Elisha had done, someone else had taken her land. And it, it, God worked it out to when she goes to entreat for her land, like, hey, you know, like, someone, did, this was stolen from me, this was my land, that uh, he was told about what had happened with her son and how Elisha had brought him back to life and then helped her out again, giving her her land back. And again, just showing you when, when you're sowing good seed and doing what's good, that'll come back to you and you'll reap that. And it may not be immediately, like in this case, she got something pretty quickly. And then also years later, uh, she, she was being blessed for, for her good works, for her, for her good, um, good heart. But let's see here. Now we got another section here, verse number 38. And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said unto a servant, Set on the great pot, and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. So there's a, a dearth is like a famine, right? There's a, there's a lack of food in the land and in Gilgal. And this is where he's hanging out with the sons of the prophets, and he says, Okay, we'll set on the great pot. We're going to feed everybody here. 
And in the story, he's talking about feeding about 100 people. So he says, we're going to make some soup. And they're potages. We're going you know, to put some stuff together. We're going to make a soup, and we're all going to eat. Verse 39, and one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full, and came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So they're gathering up things to put in the soup. Well, this guy comes across this wild vine. He has no idea what it is. And it's producing these wild gourds, right? It has some type of fruit to it, whatever it's producing. And they're like, oh, I don't know what this is. Let's just grab this up. We'll dice it up, chop it up, and throw that in the soup and see how that goes. And what happens here, verse 40, it says, so they poured out for the men to eat. So now the soup's all ready to go. They threw in these wild gourds, shred them up into the pot. And it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out and said, oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. So basically this stuff was poisonous. I mean, this is something that you should not just be throwing in there and mixing in to the pot with all the rest of the stuff that you know is good and throwing in this stuff. Well, who knows what this is? And this is what happens when you start getting involved with strange stuff, foreign things, things that's unproved, untested, and you start just adding that into your daily diet. I mean, think about spiritually speaking. You know, we ought to be getting our wisdom and our doctrine and things coming from the Word of God. And, and we, can, we know that we can trust this book. And specifically, we know we can trust the King James Bible as being accurately translated in the English language for us as the Word of God. And when you start getting into unknown stuff or, or just bad stuff, poisonous stuff, you get into the perverted Bibles, you're going to start perverting the whole pot. You're going to start perverting all of your doctrine and what you believe. And seriously, you know, take this into consideration with everything that you decide to consume, whether it be through media, through print, whatever, that you're going to allow to come in, that it's not some wild vine, some unknown thing. I mean, you could be reading all kinds of books. You go to a Christian bookstore or whatever, and you find all kinds of different books there. You don't know who wrote that book. You don't know where they're coming from. You don't know if they're saved. You don't know, you know what their angle is, what their agenda is, or if they're going to be telling you the truth or not. And you start just absorbing all this stuff. I mean, you got to be careful with that, that you're not just taking these wild gourds and you're going to end up having death in the pot. Yeah. And that's one of the things I think that we can learn from this passage here. Um, you know, dabbling with the unknown, the unproven stuff, and just willing to consume whatever you come across. And also beware of the person that's going to come to you and try to teach you with these weird, unknown doctrines that are just kind of brand new. Or stuff that's just that's that hasn't been accepted. You know, the Apostle Paul, there's there's warnings given to you know the churches at that time saying, hey, you know, what you've seen and heard from us, the gospel that we preach to you, you know, that's what you should be receiving and not this other stuff. You know, because people are gonna come in, people are gonna try to pervert the gospel, people are gonna come in with different things. And if you haven't received it from us, then don't be receiving just whoever and whatever out in the world. And we got all kinds of weird doctrines going on out there that are, have not been received. I mean, the most recent that, that has come up now, and I'm not going to, you know, this isn't the main point of the sermon by any means, but, you know, the stuff that we are Baptists. Okay, we're independent. We're fundamental Baptists, but there is some sort of meaning that goes along with being a Baptist and, and a core set of beliefs and principles that we have. And it's like when someone comes to you without with just bringing some weird, some bizarre, some wild doctrine that's not been accepted and passed down. You know, and, and look, this isn't like a Catholic church type of thing, but there's some basics and fundamentals of the Bible that when people come to you with strange doctrine, you need to watch out for that and avoid those people. I mean, the basics of salvation being by grace through faith. When someone comes to you with some weird doctrine, some perverted, some wild, some wild salvation, some works-based salvation or whatever. You don't know, you know, some Mormon salvation doctrine, you know, don't throw that into your pot of what you know is good or, or, or anything, anything for them. I mean, the Trinity, when it comes to, to basic fundamentals, baptism, 
you know, baptism by immersion, you know, these things are all real basic and real straightforward. And when people start perverting that stuff, watch out. When you start hearing heresy and things, you know, don't, don't go after those. Oh, wow, this sounds good. I've never heard this before in any other church from any other person. Anyone who actually believes the Bible and, and loves God and goes soul winning and is saved. You know, you, you could hear some things from people just in random cults or whatever, these false apostate uh, denominations. But when you start hearing this stuff creep into to churches that you consider to be good churches, watch out for that. Because it's going to corrupt a lot more. I mean, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump, the Bible says. And some false doctrine and this strange wild vine, these wild gourds, these people just want to throw into the pot. Hey, this sounds good. This looks good. And it's unproven. It's untested. It's unknown. It's weird. It's strange. It's foreign. You know, you know stick with what you know. Stick with the good stuff. And ingest that. Stick with, stick with God's word. The Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. In this story, they weren't trying. See, what he should have done is, hey, here's something. Let's try it. Right? Let's cut off a piece. Let's try it. Let's see if this is going to be good to consume. You know, we'll taste it. We'll check it out. We'll, we'll you know, see if, if this is actually good or not. That's not what they did. They got a whole lap. They just, oh man, look at all this stuff here. We're hungry. There's a dearth in the land. And look at all of this, this food I found. I'm just worried about filling my belly with more stuff. Don't even care if it's good or not. And they just chopped it right up and threw it in with the rest of it. Instead of being wise and no, test it. Try it first. Check it out before you just go all in and just throw it all in there. And that's exactly what happened in the story. We need to be testing things. And that's what I'm saying. Like, it's not like you could never read anything else. It's not like you could ever not have anyone else ever say anything to you. I mean, of course, that's ridiculous. Well, we're not a cult. But you need to be able to try these things before you just openly embrace and accept what, hey, hey here's some book. I'm just going to just absorb everything and, and not care who wrote it or not try it, not check it out, not test it first to see where this is coming from, but just let it all come on in. That's the attitude we've got to avoid. And that's, the, that, that's um, unfortunately, they didn't have the right attitude here in this story. So they got death in the pot. But thankfully, we have Elisha here, the man of God, to help and, uh, and help them out and save the day. The Bible says here, look at verse number 41. But he said, then bring meal. And he cast it into the pot and he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. So again, another miracle by Elisha. And again, I think, I think the spiritual understanding is when you don't, when, you know, test things, try the spirits, test the stuff before you just go and throw it all in. And this is one of the reasons, you know, on another note, this is another one of the reasons why You'll notice in this church, I never just have missionaries and other people selling books and other preachers that I don't know just come in and present stuff to the whole church. It's never going to happen. Missionaries are welcome to stop by and be a part of our church service, of course. But I'm going to test, I'm going to try anybody before they come and speak publicly for the whole church. And that goes for church members or people outside the church. When someone comes in as a missionary and say, oh man, can we present our material? No. No. Because I'm not going to just have my congregation just absorb whatever they want to throw out there because I don't, and, and that's going to fall on me because I didn't test and I didn't try. Now, if people come into town and I spend time with them and I have good conversations and, and see how well they can soul win and, and, and get their, you know what I mean, like get to know them somehow and try a little bit, great, absolutely. But it's not going to be just a free-for-all. And this was a free-for-all. People just throwing in whatever. Hey, I found this stuff. Let's chop that up, throw it in. Looks good to me. And you know what? Those gourds probably look good on the outside. They probably looked appetizing but they were full of death on the inside. So verse 42 now, last few verses. Verse 42, 
And there came a man from Baal Shalisha, and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, and full ears of corn in the husk thereof. And he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. So this man comes, and, and he's basically bringing Elisha a gift. So it's a really nice gift. He's saying, you know, here's, here's 20 loaves of barley and some full ears of corn. But these loaves are not like these huge loaves. Right? You've got to understand, this is what he's saying. This was, this was meant for Elisha. So he's giving him a gift, but it wasn't the, you know, so much. Um, and, and it's obvious because what he says here, Elisha is like, okay, great. Well, give it unto the people that they may eat. We see the attitude of Elisha worried about everyone else. Again, not himself, not just, oh, thanks for the gift. Now I'm just going to indulge and eat all this stuff because you gave me a gift. He's like, no, there's a, fam there's a dearth in the land. Don't forget that. He's concerned about everybody else. So he's like, okay, great. Thanks for bringing this. Give it to them. Now we could tell it wasn't very much and it definitely wasn't meant to, to feed a hundred people because he said in verse 43, and his servitor said, what? Should I set this before a hundred men? He said again, give the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and shall leave thereof. So that's what he's saying. He's like, he's like this isn't going to feed 100 people. He's like, you want me to set this before them to feed 100 people? He's like, yeah. You know why? Because God said they're going to eat it, they're going to be satisfied, and there's going to be leftovers. And we see again, there's just this total miracle. I, I would have loved to see like, to see something like that, you know? I mean, think about Jesus feeding the, the 5,000 and feeding the 4,000. And you know, another thing that, that we get from this too, the quantity never matters. 20 loaves here to feed 100 people. It's just as much of a miracle, just as much as Jesus feeding the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, just like Jesus feeding the four loaves with seven loaves, you know, or four, four loaves, four, man, it's getting late. <laughs> Feeding the, the 4,000 with seven loaves. You know, it's, it's the same miracle. It doesn't matter. The fact is, whatever you have, whatever is there, is being blessed and multiplied to satisfy however many people need to be satisfied. And it doesn't matter how much is being multiplied or, you know, the multiplication factor doesn't matter. It's still a miracle, just as much of a miracle either way. Um, so he said it before them, and they did eat, and left there of according to the word of the Lord. God's word comes true every single time. We see a lot of great examples here. Miracles being done, faith in God. God can make all things happen. God is, is you know, when you bring what you have to God, and we see this, I think that was kind of the theme to all of these miracles, is people bringing to God what they had, as much or as little as they had, and being blessed for it. That, that woman that had just a pot of oil, they got multiplied, right? The Shunammite didn't have much. I mean, she made a place for, for Elisha and the wall, like just kind of made, that's what she could do. She, that's what she had. She was able to give, feed him some meals. She was able to make a place for him and, and offer him a place to stay. That's what she had. She was blessed for that. We see the people um, here. Now, they brought death to the pot, right? They, I don't think they were blessed for the, for the death in the pot, but um, Elisha was still able to... They still brought what they had to the soup, and they were fed off of that. There was that one mistake made, but that was healed. And then we have the man who brought the gift to Elisha and Elisha turning around to, to feed the multitude. God is able to multiply. God is able to um, do the impossible. So we don't need to get super stressed out in our own lives about being taken care of because we know that, I mean, you could have $2 in your pocket and that's all you have to your name. And I firmly believe this just as God did with the bread and everything else and with the oil. God can make it where every time you pull your, your, your hand in for a dollar, there's, just, there's always another dollar there. You know, I mean, if that's what's needed, if, that, if, that's, if that's the way God's going to take care of you. I mean, when they were passing out the loaves, that's the way I see it happening. They had a basket of, of their, you know, five, you know, five loaves or whatever. And it's just like, 
every time they, they met, you know, got to another group of people sitting down, here's bread, here's some bread, here, you know, it's like never ending. Yeah. Miracle. I mean, there's, no, there's no explanation to it other than God. God's the one who did it. And, uh, and praise God for that. So let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, these great stories of these, these awesome miracles, Lord, and um, thank you for using such great men of God to, to perform these things and to show us, one, how much you care for us and that we, and, and no matter what our circumstances are, we need to be just reliant on you and know that, that things can look as bad as anyone could ever imagine they could be in this lifetime, dear Lord, but if we just have our faith in you, we know that you can come through for us and pull us out of any situation, dear Lord, and to, and to save us from anything. God, help us to have a great faith, to, um, to act on that faith, and to not just um, have a faith in, our, in word only, but also in, in our deeds and our actions, dear Lord, and the things that we do, that we truly do rest in you, and that we're not going to get too um, distracted with all the, the mammon of this world, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us all to manage our finances better, that we can not waste the things that you have blessed us with, and also that we wouldn't get wrapped up in the consumerism of uh, just getting into debt over everything and racking up credit card debt and um, just, just thinking that we're going to pay everything off later and getting ourselves further and further into bondage, dear Lord. I pray that you please just give us wisdom in that area as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.